So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces. We talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 47 for our group chats, and I'm super excited to welcome on Adam Fishman, who is currently Chief Product and Growth Officer at Imperfect Foods. So prior to Imperfect Foods, Adam was VP of Growth at Patreon, then Head of Growth at Lyft. This is quite the incredible background and is definitely one of the top minds when it comes to marketplace product and growth. So Adam, wow, welcome to the uh, group chat and what a treat it is to have you uh, join us here today. We have quite a bit to chat about with our product and growth uh, when it comes to marketplaces, but before we do, maybe if you could share a little bit more on your background and what led you to marketplaces, that'd be great. Sure. Um, well, I'm excited to be here and chat with all of you. Um, I love talking about this stuff um, and I don't get nearly as many opportunities these days because I don't have a lot of free time. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, let's see what, um, what my background, um, so about almost 10 years ago now, um, I joined, uh, a little known company, um, called Zimride that was building a ride sharing marketplace between cities, um, like, uh, San Francisco and LA. And that company became, that was the foundation for Lyft, um, before that, I'd, I'd basically worked in a bunch of different technology companies, mostly e-commerce, um, travel, retail, things like that. So, so Zimride and Lyft was the first foray into um, marketplaces. And then um, I was there for a while. And then I did a bunch of marketplace consulting and advising for a while after Lyft. Um, and uh, and then also worked for an education marketplace called Wiseant, which just got acquired by IXL um, Learning uh, pretty recently, like within the last few months. Um, they were a tutoring marketplace, um, and then Patreon, and now um, Imperfect. And so I guess what uh, attracts me to marketplace type businesses, and Imperfect isn't particularly a marketplace, although we do have um supply and demand considerations because we have inventory that we manage and um we do control our own sort of supply chain but it, it's still um we can't generate too much demand uh and we can't have too much supply um because it costs us money um but i guess what attracts me to marketplaces is just the um the overall kind of complexity of the of the business there's um, you know, multiple actors, multiple customers um, with different sort of incentives and different needs. Um, and it's kind of like a big game of whack-a-mole. Once you solve one problem, there's like another problem to solve. So, you know, in the early days of Lyft, it was very, um, we were very focused on building uh, a stable base of supply because that's what we needed to satisfy almost unlimited demand. And then almost as soon as you get that right, then you have to focus on the demand side. Um, and so you kind of go back and forth and back and forth. And it's just such a holistic um, problem. It's, it's really complicated. Um, and I think that's what's been so attractive um, to me about it. And I say the other thing is I'm really mission oriented in my approach and what I um value a lot is that the, the people if if i do my job well um that people have a better outcome a lot of people have a better outcome in life and um that was true of drivers of tutors and educators and students um it was true of creators at patreon um it's now true of the food system uh at, at imperfect and the people who participate in that food system and so there's something about marketplaces that uh, put power back in the hands of suppliers um, and uh, and help them, um, you know, grow and legitimize the work that they're doing and and make an income and and things like that. At least in you know consumer marketplaces. And so um, so yeah, so that gets me really excited about about doing the work. That's awesome. Thanks for uh, sharing more with us on that. So uh, yeah, I was actually going to ask uh, about uh, mission-driven marketplaces because I had a note on that. It seems like you uh, have uh, found quite a few of them that are, that are incredible. Um, so if we kind of go back to the early days of Lyft, um, were you part of Zimride prior to Lyft or could you share a little bit more about kind of like what stage you came in at and, and what you were working on there? Yeah, so I interviewed for Zimride um, uh, to be in 2011. 
Um, and the company was started in 2007 by, by John and Logan. Um, and uh, when I joined the company, what they had was they basically had created a closed uh, ride, private ride sharing network, mostly for college campuses. So they would sell the, the software to transportation departments um, in college campuses and then some enterprise businesses to create closed circuit carpool networks for their employees. And they monetized Zimride basically by selling like a sales model, like selling um, uh, annual contracts into these, into these businesses. And I joined to help them take the consumer, like launch and sort of grow the consumer marketplace, which was, I wanna go from San Francisco to Los Angeles. I could take a bus, I could take a plane, or I could share a ride with somebody who's already going on that, on that route. Um, and so I was in charge of growing that. Um, which was, which was interesting. I mean, the business model there was really unproven. We weren't monetizing. We weren't dealing with any of the transactions on the platform. It all happened sort of off platform and we were just facilitating the connection, um, and really trying to replace like the Craig share Craigslist, Craigslist ride share boards. Um, so we launched uh, a bunch of routes on the West Coast. We launched the East Coast. We were also sort of like building the product at the same time. Um, and about six months in, we pivoted most of the company to Lyft. So that was in May of 2012. Um, and the reason, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for doing that. Um, one of which is just Zimride wasn't a particularly great business with product market fit. Um, and so, because the the frequency of use case was so, um, it was so infrequent, right? And so you think about um, going from, I'll use FFLA as an example, you think about going between those two cities, maybe not so much these days with COVID, but you think about going between those cities in a, in a non-pandemic time. And, um, you know, there's like I mentioned, there's a bunch of ways that you could get between those cities. Maybe you go, I don't know, four or five times a year if you have some family in either place. Um, but the problem is maybe you're willing to share a ride as a passenger, as a driver, like two out of those five times, maybe one out of those five times. And so just staying top of mind for folks was really hard and getting liquidity in that marketplace was really hard. And so we pivoted to Lyft, which was um, much shorter, more frequent trips. Um, and what we saw was just a much more common repeatable use case, right? So the business, um, it, it was just a fundamentally better and, and well, different and better business as a result. And we didn't have to worry about staying top of mind. I mean, the mustaches helped too, pink mustaches, um, for those who know the, that lore, but, um, but it just, you know, you might go, you might use a lift like three times in a night. Um, as opposed to Zimride one time in a year. And so even, um, so, so just the, the, freak, the natural occurring frequency of that local travel was, was much better as a business model than long, long distance ride sharing. Um, and Zimride, we sold to Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And then I think I read just recently that they had shut it down um, after a pretty good run. But um, and maybe they came to the same conclusion that we came to. So, yeah, that's awesome. That's, awesome. that's uh, quite the throwback, and it's pretty incredible to hear the uh, just the phrase we pivoted to Lyft nowadays. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was actually uh, I was kind of doing some uh, research prior to the uh, group chat, and I saw a great post um, that you wrote it, which appears to be kind of right after Lyft about the uh, five tenets of a successful growth team. And yeah. uh, which is really great. And I'll share that in the, uh, in the notes to this after, but I wanted to maybe chat about kind of like looking back at it now, you know, what's the kind of DNA or makeup of a, a successful growth team? Yeah, it's a good question. That, and that post may be a bit dated from, you know, my opinions have changed quite a, quite a bit over the course of um, the last decade of doing this. Um, so I think, uh, so I have sort of a few a few opinions on this. One is that I think that um, you know there used to be a world where you had marketing on one side, you had product management on the other side, and you had growth sort of sitting in the middle, which was really 
an integrated approach to marketing and product management um, where folks didn't have to like lob things over the wall to each other. Um, and it was sort of this vertically oriented uh, team and that was really effective. Um, I think mostly because of the organizational cruft that exists between marketing and product. And so what I, I, I still believe in the idea of uh, vertically orienting um, teams and at, and at Imperfect, um, I actually oversee the entire marketing function and um, the entire product management function. And what I've done is um, sort of the next evolution of that, which is we have growth marketing teams who spend dollars to acquire customers and retain customers. And each one of those teams has a product counterpart and they share the same goals. Um, and so the acquisition um, growth marketing team uh, has a similar set of goals to the new customer experience product team. Even though that team is not necessarily called a, a growth team, they're responsible for the, the full stack of our acquisition and activation effort together. Um, their incentives are aligned, they, um, they, uh, the roadmaps are aligned, um, and so, and they can't be successful without each other. Um, and so that's sort of the model that I um, have adopted over, over time, as opposed to a standalone growth function that sort of borrows from each of these um, components. I find that um, good growth product work is actually just good product work, right? Like it's outcomes oriented product development and growth marketing is just outcomes oriented marketing work. Um, and so the key is the, the outcome that you're focusing the team, the team on and aligning all of the incentives together so that people are, are rowing in the same direction. Um, and I think the evolution that companies went through was to have a growth team to prove out that that's the right model is to align all these incentives. And then now um, where this stuff sits in the organization, it's kind of doesn't matter as long as they're working on the, the right stuff and there's no barriers to, um, to making progress. Um, so yeah, I guess it's a little bit of a long winded answer to your, to your question, but um, that, uh, that there's some pieces of that article that I wrote um, that are still true and, and probably some that uh, I've evolved my thinking on a bit. Awesome. Thanks for sharing more with us on that. So uh, if we were to kind of uh, go, go beyond, you know, Lyft and um, to the next phase, uh, was it at, uh, at uh, what was the marketplace again? Was oh, the Wyzant? EdTech marketplace was called Wyzant. Yeah. Wyzant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So your kind of um, journey uh, through marketplaces and kind of leading product and growth, if we were to just kind of like, you know, go up at the, like the highest level, um, would you say that they're typically, you know, you, you come into the marketplaces at a similar stage or, you know, what is, what is it that you look for as far as with opportunities maybe? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. A lot of folks ask me that, um, that question. Um, so I have, I have basically, again, my thinking on this has evolved, um, over time. I, I, uh, and I, and my requirements might be different than folks on this call for, for a few reasons. One is, um, I have a family, a mortgage, <laughs> two kids, um, you know, et cetera. Uh, and so um, there's a certain stage of company that is too early for me to join, even not just like with financial considerations, but, um, but just the types of problems that I like to solve. So um, I look for three main criteria when I think about joining, joining a company more broadly. Um, first criteria is, um, uh, is it, it does the does the business have a fantastic mission? Um, and by that I mean we're not selling widgets. We're doing we're doing work that leads to better outcomes for people. So in the case of Lyft, that was that was drivers. In the case of Wiseant, that was students and tutors. Um, in the case of Patreon, that was creators. Um, basically, being able to buy homes and have income and all the things that, that they weren't able to do before. 
Um, and in the case of Imperfect, it's the entire food system from growers and suppliers to warehouse workers to people having access to healthier food options um, delivered to their door during a pandemic. Um, so number one's mission. My job is to grow companies and, and if those companies get really big, I want a lot of people to have a better outcome. Um, so that's one. Two is um, solid, uh, disciplined financial management. Um, I have worked at companies that light money on fire um, and think money is a renewable resource. Um, I have worked at companies that won't spend a dime because they're so worried about profitability and, um, and you know, so they, they basically don't invest. Um, I like to be somewhere in the middle, right? I think, um, I think responsible growth is the way to think about it. Um, companies that are willing to invest to grow, um, but aren't lighting money on fire and are doing so responsibly and have a clear, clear financial discipline, a, a strong P&L, know the balance sheet really well. Um, that matters a lot to me, um, which kind of precludes some of the earlier stage companies, right? Who are just sort of finding their way. Um, and then the third thing is, third, third criteria that I have is, is, um, is people um, obviously need to work with fantastic, passionate uh, people. But if I like zoom out for a second and talk about stage of company, I think, um, you know, I've learned a, a lot about myself over the course of doing product and growth work for a long time now. Um, I, the, the types of challenges that I enjoy are um, challenges of scale, right? We know we have product market fit. We know that we have a product that people want and we need to refine, refine and get that in front of more people and um, tune the experience that you have when you come to the site or the app or, or whatever. Um, so um, that's, that sort of precludes the really early stage companies who are still trying to find their way in a pre-product market fit scenario. And I don't actually think that that's a place where I'm well suited. Um, and I advised a bunch of those companies following Lyft. Um, and I think one of the things that was frustrating for me and probably frustrating for the people that I worked with is the problem with being in, in uh, growth and trying to work with a pre-product market fit company is you don't know if the things that you're doing are not working because they're the wrong strategy or the wrong approach, or if they're not working because no one wants to buy the thing that you're selling, um, which is a, was a product market fit problem, right? And so that can be really challenging for a, for a growth practitioner because um, you just don't get a lot of signal on the work that you're doing. It could, it, it, it could be that the the thing that you're trying to do, the company that you're trying to grow is just fundamentally not of interest to most people and you haven't found that customer base yet. And so um, so for me, that's really a really frustrating place to be because I like to know that there is a customer base, an audience or whatever for what we're doing. And we just have to find out how to reach them and um, and solve the problems that they have with the, with the product. Um, so that, that's sort of how I pick, which, which definitely means the companies that I work with as of later, a little bit later stage, um, still uh, not public. Um, I think, um, you know, they're in a place where that's, that's on the table, right? Um, there's lots of rumors about Patreon being, being public. Obviously Lyft went public um, after I left um, many, many years later. Um, so it's sort of that sweet spot where maybe like a few years out from being that, um, that I tend to tend to focus on. Um, and uh, yeah, really in like building and growing, growing the company mode. Awesome. That's really helpful. I think it'll be uh, great for some of the founders in the group that are, uh, you know, trying to understand how to attract top talent too and uh, mm -hmm. build, build, a, build a great team. Let's uh, jump into Imperfect Foods. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, what was, what led you to join the company and maybe what were some of the signals, um, as you were kind of just describing, uh, that in your mind, like this is the right opportunity to pursue. Yeah. Well, so first, I mean, if you, if you think back to the three criteria that I have, like obviously fantastic mission, 
right? We're on a, we're on a, uh, our mission is to build um, uh, a kinder, um, better food system. Um, and, you know, that's everything from sort of access to food uh, through our reduced cost box program or through to getting into food deserts and things like that, um, all the way to paying a fair wage for the people who work with us, paying farmers and suppliers a fair wage, um, and then passing on, you know, any and a majority of cost savings directly to, to customers. And so um, fantastic mission to eliminate food waste build a more sustainable food system. Um, so check that box. Um, from a financial discipline standpoint, um, Imperfect is a quite a large company. We, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily know from the, from the outside, especially if in the early days you saw, you know, ugly produce ads from us when we were just Imperfect Produce, but um, we employ like 17, 1800 people. Um, we own six fulfillment centers across the United States. Um, we're servicing the major, like the majority of the lower 48. Um, I think we, we deliver to 43 of the, of the 48 states. Um, and obviously during the pandemic, uh, our business rocketed forward. So we went from being uh, just a produce company or sort of what I like to say is the CSA box on steroids um, to, uh, to a full service gro like subscription grocery business. And so now you can get just about everything that you need for a weekly grocery trip from Imperfect, from like meat and fish and eggs and milk and cheese to, of course, all the produce and you know pastas and things like that. So um, really big, growing company, very financially disciplined. We have a CFO. We are smart about how we spend our money. We have you know audited financials. Sort of the whole the whole nine yards. Um, um, we're not just, you know, messing around. Um, and then I think, and we have a really great trajectory of where we're going. Um, and then three is um, fantastic people. So the leadership team at Imperfect is, is awesome. Um, obviously, everyone's here for the right reasons. Um, and uh, we now have a seasoned C CEO who has been a business leader in the past at other bigger companies. The founders have both sort of stepped back from the, from the business. Um, but stay, you know, somewhat involved still, which is great. Um, and uh, there's a real commitment up and down the company to to our mission. Um, and so that's that's. Um, it wasn't necessarily a business that I knew a ton about before I joined. Um, but once I started to learn about it, I was kind of I was blown away by by the um, the uh, the scale uh, and what wasn't obvious from from the surface. Um, and I'd say one other thing that caused me to join is when I joined the company in June of last year, I think we had two product managers and seven engineers for a business that was going to do, you know, a lot of revenue. <laughs> I can't say exact numbers. We don't disclose that, but a lot of revenue. Um, and um, to me, when I looked at that and I said, wow, how are we able to do this? with a technology team of like, you know, two PMs and, and seven engineers, almost no marketing function. Um, all I saw was potential, right? Every corner of the business has potential and, and opportunity. And even just our focus in 2021 is getting the basics right, right? Getting the basics of an e-commerce subscription business, making sure that it it works as expected um, and it's intuitive. And that is gonna transform our growth, just, just nailing the basics. Um, not to mention all the things that we can then go on and do after we get that right. So there's just a huge untapped potential at this, at this company um, and a real appetite to invest uh, and to, to, re to realize that potential. All the things that I really like um, when I'm thinking about joining a company, so. Awesome. Yeah. And it's definitely uh, quite interesting. I know we're going to have a few questions when we uh, jump into the Q and a, but uh, when I was researching, I was definitely uh, fascinated. So, um, so maybe uh, before we get into the questions though, um, I did want to ask uh, just to uh, get a little bit more on, uh, you know, at your, at your time right now, um, what are maybe some unique challenges there from, from the growth side? Yeah. Um, great question. So I think 
number one challenge, and a lot of people are dealing with this as well, is what is the macro environment with COVID uh, going to do to our business, right? Have grocery shopping habits fundamentally changed? Are people, is everyone here to stay? Or are we going to see um, changes in retention and, and skipping behavior and cadence and things like that? And the answer is we don't really know. Like we're, we're sort of planning for the worst and, um, and hustling to, to deliver the best, right? Um, I don't want to say hoping for the best because hope is not a strategy. Um, and so, um, so but, but no one really knows, right? We don't know what's going to happen to advertising prices in the marketplace um, as advertisers have been sitting on the sidelines come back. Well, we can guess what's going to happen. Prices are going to go up. Um, and um, there's uncertainty within, you know, we, we spend money on Facebook. There's uncertainty within the Facebook ecosystem around privacy and what is that going to mean for targeting and reaching the right people and things like that. So I would say that that is one of the things that keeps me up at night is just it's an uncertain future. And so we we're taking it day by day and we rerun our forecast pretty regularly because we learn new information every single week, right? Um, and so, so that's one thing. The second thing that keeps me up at night is um, from a, from a long-term growth perspective, um, it, Imperfect has gone from being, you know, a great CSA box to a mediocre grocer to now a great grocer. Um, we're adding more SKUs. We're becoming a more of a full service grocer with a, with an amazing sustainable mission. Um, but there's a question about our long term. What are we for customers, right? Are we a subs are we the first and only subscription grocery service, right? You don't think about subscription and grocery. You think about subscription with meal kits and things like that. But but groceries are you know there's a hundred years of habit built up around around grocery shopping, and so. For us to be a subscription grocery company, that means we have to define that as a category, right? There's also like, are we not bad and are we a just a online grocery store? Um, but there are benefits and drawbacks to the subscription nature of our business. Um, there are benefits and drawbacks to just operating like a grocery store, like like you're used to. And so, what are the thing the things that we have to think about are more fundamental business model um, and, uh, challenges and, um, you know, as the, as like a C-level executive who sort of is responsible for the almost the majority of the metrics of the business, um, making the wrong decision there could be really uh, long-term harmful, right? And so I'm talking to a ton of customers now, um, trying to understand the shortcomings in our product, um, where are we too rigid? Where do they want more flexibility? What does that flexibility mean for the things that we build over the long term? Um, and so it's just really unique and interesting challenge that sits at the intersection of growing the company, building the product, um, and also the messaging and how we talk about our, our service. So um, that that is a, a fantastic challenge, um, but there's no, immediately obvious answer to that to that problem and i guess that's what that's that's the problems you wrestle with as you go higher in a company the ones where there aren't any obvious answers um and uh and um and everything is a hard problem so um so yeah so those are the, those are some of the things that are keeping me keeping me up at up at night um uh you know uh th these days Awesome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing with us. So that definitely prompted a few uh, messages. So we'll jump in mm -hmm. here and to uh, questions in a second. Um, but before we do, so I've asked you quite a few questions, um, but is there anything, you know, for earlier stage marketplace founders, uh, given your uh, incredible experience, um, maybe with uh, on the product and growth side that you'd like to share with us before we do? Yeah, let's see. For earlier stage founders, um, I think uh, you know the earliest problems that a marketplace faces are those are, are liquidity problems, right? Um, 
and certainly we face those at Lyft and um, Wiseant and things like that. And so I still think the original uh, the original conclusion that I had from the Lyft days is important, which is that you have to you have you can't fight a battle across both fronts simultaneously. You can't be doing supply and demand with a resource constrained smaller company while you're also trying to find product market fit. One of those things has to be fixed, right? So, um, so uh, uh, for us in the early days at, um, at Lyft, we had um, a lot of pent up demand and we didn't have enough supply to meet that demand. So we didn't have to worry, worry about demand generation for a long time. Um, but we had to do is figure out how to onboard drivers successfully and how to build that that machine to do that at scale. Um, and so we were able to focus on on that. Um, and we did some creative things even in the big beginning to try to fix supply. We paid drivers um, hourly guarantees um, to, to, to get them to drive. Um, and uh, and only when we got to a point where there was a lot of liquidity in the marketplace were we able to remove that um, uh, system. Um, also, that system sort of created some strange incentives um, for for drivers too. But um, but that's that's for a different time. But you, I guess, my overall advice is something has to be fixed. Like there must be um, a thing that's not a moving target in order for you to successfully. Um, scale, uh, you know, get get started scaling your marketplace and build that initial liquidity. Because um, if you're trying to fight across all the fronts at the same time, it's going to be really, really challenging, um, especially when you don't have a lot of people um, to do that work. So, um, so yeah, uh, that's that's my that's my advice uh, to to early stage marketplace founders. No, that's great. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for sharing with us. So cool. So we have a few questions here. Um, hey, Rich, did uh, did you want to jump on? Yeah, sure. Hey, Adam, um, founder of Bamboo. We're building the Instacart for wholesale food supplies. So basically, um, the average restaurant owner or chef will run down to the local Costco or Restaurant Depot right now to manually pick up their stuff. So we're trying to help solve those problems. Um, so we're kind of like a food marketplace and also a delivery marketplace, which is like very complex. And just wanted to dig in a little bit more around that example you're giving, giving with Lyft. Right now, we're trying to focus on that supply side, um, find drivers. But our challenge is that the, the driver may need a bigger vehicle, like a truck. They may need to have be paid more because they're doing like more manual work. Wondering if you had any thoughts around how we should maybe like focus on that supply side. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think you... Uh, well, I would say a few things. Um, it depends on what you're willing to invest, right, in the supply side as a company, right? So um, I'll tell you what we would have done at Lyft in this scenario. We would have literally rented vehicles for, for drivers and said, like, here you go, um, here's, here's a truck. Or we would have specifically looked for people that, that, could, that could demonstrate that they had access to those types of vehicles or put that as part of the requirements or, or things like that. Um, in terms of paying people more, um, sure, like do the thing that doesn't scale because you won't pay people more over the long term, but you do need to do that in order to get to your initial um, liquidity and prove out that there's real demand there for the, for the marketplace. So um, that, that's sort of my like high level, you know, I'm not into the problems of your marketplace specifically, but that, but that's my advice is do those things that, that you know, you won't do eventually, um, but are pretty critical to proving out the, the fit of what it is that you're trying to, to achieve, because you can always optimize for cost and things like that down during, during the long run. But if you can't demonstrate liquidity or, or any sort of glimmer of, um, of interest, then you're going to have much bigger problems than cost management. Got it. And on that point, um, how do you look at pricing for your customers? So we're doing pricing tests, et cetera. How do you think about, because you know what your cost is short term, but it's like modeling what the price is for the long term to get that product market fit is the hard thing. Yeah, price, um, pricing a product is really challenging. Um, it, and I mean, there are entire consultancies that are developed that do only that, like 
Simon Kushner and um, and uh, uh, and and for example, um, and we used those. I've used those folks in the past. Um, they're not going to be very cost effective at your scale. Um, I think that there are um, there are definitely sort of sensitivity tests that you can run um, where you show people different prices and you test um, demand and things like that. I think. Um, you know, this is a this is a game that you play mostly in spreadsheets, right? Like, what is what what is the price that what's the the lowest price that we can that we can charge in order to um, to still be a, a viable business? And um, and then also, what are people willing to pay on the other side? And so, the willing to pay, you can do a lot of um, like sort of fake or landing page uh, tests to understand people's willingness um, to pay. You can survey customers. You can survey around asking what they find valuable in your service and um, and sort of get it get it that way. I mean, there's a lot of different ways um, that you can uh, that you can um, do that. Uh, and I would say, you know, I would definitely. Um, I would definitely look at things like um, priceonomics and um, and uh, and things like that because they have tons of content on how you price products. Um, so uh, so take a look, um, look at those types of things, and uh, and it'll at least be a a starting point for you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for uh, thanks for the question. That was that was a good. Um, let's see. Uh, hey, Jeff, did you uh, want to jump on? Yeah, Adam, I was just wondering, uh, Jeff from StockX, if you can talk a little bit more. That you know, sounds like Imperfect's that interesting inflection point where you're trying to decide on exactly what problem you are trying to solve. I've always, like if I was, if I were you, it seemed, you know, I'm just curious, like um, I've always been sort of looking for like the stitch fix meets groceries or delivery. I'm just curious, like what, what structurally prevents food? Like why, why hasn't there been a player there yet? Or is that like, there's gotta be something structurally in the business that I just don't know about. Yeah, I think, um, I think that one of the challenges that is unique about food is that it's a perishable good, right? Especially produce um, and it's damageable. Right, like that that pair of Stitch Fix, uh, that Stitch Fix clothing is not going to necessarily get damaged in transit. Um, if you mess it up, you can send, get it back. Um, if we send you stuff that you don't want, um, it's wasted, yeah, that's it. right? And and and, um, yeah. and that our mission is to eliminate one of our parts of our mission is to eliminate food waste, right? So we send a customer things that they're not inherently interested in, well, they feel bad because they're here for the mission too. And then they end up wasting stuff. And then we, um, we you know, we're not doing our job. And so I think the perishable nature of it is, is a big, um, a big concern. Um, and so, so that's a thing. Um, I'd say the other thing is like, we run a very tight supply chain because we don't keep things in our uh, facility for very long and there's cold chain and and sort of like how, you, how like cold chain coverage and how you keep things at a certain temperature and stuff like that and so the the logistical complexity is just really really high with with grocery um i would say um that's that's on the one hand on the other hand we are trying to learn customers habits um and the more that is one of the key advantages of a subscription service that's fully customizable is over time, the more you shop with us, the better we should be able to get at understanding what should go in your basket every week, right? And we start people with a basket of goods that then, then they can fully customize. They can take everything out or they can add everything to it. Um, it's sort of up, up to them. So we are moving in this direction of like sort of, um, algorithmically populated shopping cart. Um, and uh, yeah, and so we'll get there uh, eventually. Um, 
but uh but it you know it's um it's it's a thing that's taken us a while because we also didn't really have the basics of e-commerce uh well dialed in um probably for the first four or five years of the company's life um, yeah so yeah so we got to get that right and then we can build on top of it yeah operations and stuff is just same here with StockX. it's just so under can be so underappreciated um in yeah the, in like the pure tech world yeah Cool. I actually had a question for you myself. And um, that was with the kind of rebrand um, into more grocery from produce. Um, you know, what, what were some of like the uh, kind of like nuanced decisions around that um, to do that, to expand categories? And then also to uh, kind of like a follow up I wanted to ask after that uh, might be kind of uh, within that too. Uh, and the answer is um, as far as uh, expanding locations. Yeah. Um... So I wasn't, so I, I will talk about what I know of the rebrand because it happened in late 2019, which is a bit before I joined. Um, but from what I understand, um, you can think about when you can think about the ambition of the business to, to solve food waste and create a more sustainable food system. Um, we're never going to get there just doing produce, right? Because there's a massive amount of waste across the entire system and water usage and energy and CO2 emissions and things like that. And, um, you know, our customers wanted to do more of their grocery shopping with us because they're very aligned with our mission. And the more that we make it, we essentially make it easy for people to make the right decisions. Like they know that they can shop with Imperfect and we're doing the hard work of making sure those products are sourced really well, making sure that they're sustainable, they have a clean ingredients list, like all that sort of stuff. And the more products we offer, um, the better that is for the, for the customer, right? And so um, I think we started with sort of pantry type items, like very shelf stable things. But we realized it's like, you know, the reason people go to the grocery store is because they want to buy the $150 worth of, stuff every couple of weeks, right? And um, that includes milk and, and other forms of dairy and eggs and meat and fish and, you know, spices and, and the whole nine yards. And our model can be applied to all of those things. And so we were not fully delivering on our, on our mission as just a produce, a customizable produce company. Um, so that I think first and foremost is what, what went into it. We started with a customer we knew customers wanted more from us and we said okay we're going to figure out how to how to do this um all that happened at the end of 2019 we got into 2020 and then COVID hit and we got really big really fast um i like to say uh that we had no business being as big as we got um and we basically accelerated across i don't know three years of growth in a span of four months um so imagine doing that while trying to change your entire business um, and offer more stuff. I mean, things were falling apart on the on the scenes. We went from having um, a business that expertly packs boxes and has a 90 plus uh, perfect order rate, which is the rate at which we get people all of the things that they want successfully to like single digits because of all of the demand of, of COVID. And that was a really big problem for us. So we spent a lot of 2020 getting up to the scale to deliver a full grocery shop to people um, and while the demands on the business kept increasing. And so that's been um, some of the biggest challenges with, with, this, with this change as a business is just, um, getting to that scale and it's now it's complicated because if you put eggs in the same box as a watermelon um you know what's going to happen to those eggs right um and so the, adding more things and adding things that require refrigeration or freezer packs and stuff it's just expanded the operational complexity of our business um but uh i i'm i'm happy to say that we're we're now you know almost a year later doing a really phenomenal job right um, it, it took a while. It took a lot of trial and error in the facilities and things like that, but we have a really dedicated operational team um, who's working super hard. Um, <clears throat> and I think your second question was around expansion, um, like regional expansion and things like that. 
Um, yeah, so we cover a lot of the lower 40, 48. I think I said we're in 43 of the 48 um, states. We just launched in Denver uh, or in the greater like Denver, Boulder area this week. Um, there's parts of the country that we still don't cover particularly well. The Southeast, for example, we, um, we have fulfillment centers in San Antonio and in um, near Baltimore, Maryland in a town called Severn. Um, we can't really effectively get to the Southeast from those two places. So it's certainly a um, consideration for us is what is a, what does it look like for Imperfect to go into the Southeast? Um, but I think the other thing is when we look at the footprint that we do cover today and how many customers are in those markets and potential customers, um, there's a lot of density that we can create, um, which actually helps uh, us in our quest to build a kinder food system because the denser that our routes are the more deliveries we can do in a in a certain time window the lower our co2 emissions et cetera, et cetera. and so that's actually really really important um, there's a very high ceiling in a lot of the markets that we're in and we can get a lot bigger and have a lot more customers there um, so that you know yes we're expanding Yes, we launched Denver in the greater like Colorado, um, but uh, take a market like Los Angeles. There's like almost infinite demand in in the greater LA metro region, and so a lot a lot of seat high ceiling there. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for uh, sharing on that. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I was I was kind of interested to see uh, or to hear more about the kind of density of demand in some of the markets. So mm -hmm. cool. So we're gonna have time for uh, one more question, and uh, I think uh, Rich wanted to jump back on. Hey again, Adam. Um, I'm curious about the supply side on your end. So when you're choosing local producers and farms and, and stuff, how do you go about doing that? Because um, obviously right now we're trying to decide who our supply side is. Do we go for the big box names? Do we go for the more unique suppliers? I'm curious how you, you guys approach it. Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. I think First and foremost, Imperfect can work with a lot more suppliers and smaller suppliers because of our sourcing model. Um, and so we, I think we look to suppliers who are going to be fantastic partners. We don't work with a lot of the like biggest of the big um, suppliers because for us, um, we can go to uh, an individual farmer and say, hey, we'll buy your entire crop of oranges, um, the good, the, the ugly, like the whole thing. And we'll pay you a fair price for everything. And they are like, great, well, I'll work with you. Um, and so, you know, we have like hundreds of suppliers um, and then certainly some name brand companies because folks wanna know that they can get some name brand things that they're proud of, but a big part of that is working with with name brands that have a really good commitment that matches that matches ours. So, um, and local providers that have that that same commitment. So we launched when we launched in Colorado, um, we worked with we added on a bunch of um, local uh, Colorado suppliers um, and some recognizable brands, Justin's Peanut Butter and, and things like that because. Um, we wanted to be part of that community, right? And that stuff's manufactured in, in Colorado. Um, but yeah, I would say we, we tend to, so that, that's one thing. The second thing is we are also private labeling a lot of our products. So you can now buy imperfect, uh, imperfect branded chicken. Um, you can buy imperfect branded cheese, salmon, um, ground beef, uh, you know, et cetera. And, and that's only growing. Um, we have a line of like health and bath and body products and things like that. And so like over the long term, we expect more and more and more of our assortment will be under the imperfect private label, um, which means we can source from, you know, tons and tons of farmers and, um, and suppliers and, um, and create our own sort of unique spin on things, especially like we have a ton of snack products and things like that, that are all private labeled um, and delicious. Um, so, 
Yeah, so we we definitely work with more of the long tail of far, of suppliers as a as a result of our of our model. Um, the second thing I would say is most big national brands like um, retail grocery brands they try to sort of standardize and buy nationally, and there's only so many suppliers that can supply at that volume, mm-hmm. and we don't try to do national. Uh, buying uh, very often, so we we by that we open we open up our um, supply chain to more to more folks, um, which is something we're really proud of. How, how do your suppliers feel about the private labeling? Are they do they encourage it? Do they mind? Is it competition with them? Um, well, in a lot of cases, we're buying things that they can't otherwise sell. So I'll give you a great example. One of our most popular products is. Um, uh, chocolate covered pretzel pieces. And so we buy the broken pretzel bits that come from the manufacturer because they aren't going to bag those, right? They're going to sell only whole pretzel pieces. So we, we buy those. We then put our own chocolate covering on them and then package them in an imperfect package. Um, and so they love it because they get paid for basically what would just get dumped on the floor and and swept out and we look at that and we say well that's perfectly good stuff it tastes the same it's mm-hmm. just a little broken and customers love it and we're able to offer it at a really great price for people and so like I, if you talk to a lot of imperfect customers anyone who's had the chocolate covered pretzel pieces um they will say that that is like one of their top products that they get it every week and it's like super addictive so um yeah so in that in cases like that suppliers love it because um they get paid for something that they wouldn't otherwise get uh get paid for that's great thank you yeah awesome that was a that's a great example so and thanks for sharing with us about that um, so we're almost out of time here. I feel like we could uh, go on uh, talking about this for quite a bit. Um, I actually usually ask a question on what's a memorable moment um, kind of in, in your, uh, you know, given your background and experience. But I, uh, for this, you had me uh, thinking with the chocolate covered pretzels. Um, what's actually your favorite food? Oh, wow. I spend a lot of money with Imperfect every week. Um, so that's a great question. Um, I... I obviously like the chocolate covered pretzel pieces. Um, I I like pretty much all of our snack items. I think my favorite, one of my favorite things that we sell um, and I eat like every week is probably the, um, the, uh, the salmon, the imperfect uh, foods, um, uh, Atlantic salmon. And I'll tell you why, why it's imperfect and why I love it. So it's, it's imperfect because when you go into a butcher or like a fish market and you're buying salmon, they're only selling a cut of the fish that is like the mid section of the salmon. It's like really thick and it's super vibrant. And like, that's all that they're selling because that's what sort of shows the best in the, in the, um, in the count on the counter. We take the piece that doesn't make it into the butcher, that sort of the tail, it's a little thinner, it might be a little smaller, maybe it's like smaller cuts and things like that. And we package that up and we, and we sell it and it's like amazing salmon. It just might be a touch thinner, but it's like perfectly sized for my kids. It's like, so I can make a package of this and it feeds the family. Um, I love it. It's delicious. It's super affordable. It's like $9.99 for a pack of salmon, which is like, show me a place where you can get salmon for that price. And it's, uh, you know, sustainably raised and like, it's just incredible. So I have it on recurring, we have recurring items that get added to your cart every week. I have salmon as one of a handful of recurring items because I want to make sure that it's in my cart every week and I'm buying it. Um, so that's probably like one of my, it doesn't sound very exciting, but like it's, it's a, has a great story. It tastes amazing. It's, uh, it's something that you might be like imperfect salmon. What does that mean? Um, 
and it's delicious. And my kids eat it, which is like a big bar for me. So, um, so uh, yeah, so that's one of my, one of my favorites. And then obviously there's a long tail of other things that, uh, that I have that are favorites, but um, awesome. that's definitely one. Yeah. Sold. Sold. It might be a few of our favorites <laughs> too that are on the uh, chat. Cool. Well, nice. cool. well this nice. is a yeah. really, this is really incredible chat. So thanks again for taking the time to uh, join us and share more. So I really appreciate it. Um, right before yeah. we wrap though, just a quick kind of plug. Um, where can we keep up with you? Great question. Um, I, you know, occasionally I post some things on Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is Fishman AF. Um, and uh, yeah, that's probably a good starting spot. Um, I respond to a lot of DMs and things like that. Um, you know, I try to do the Reforge, uh, I teach like a Reforge course one, one night through their um, membership. Um, but yeah, Twitter's probably the best place, uh, best place to, to get me. Awesome. So, cool. well, you, you have to be able to to also accept um random musings about my kids and stuff like that too if you follow me on twitter so awesome awesome i'll, I'll include it uh, a link to it in the uh, in the details of this so cool. I, I know you're uh, you. head, heads down so i definitely appreciate taking the time once again to uh, join us today so thank you yeah thanks for all the great questions everybody too this was fun love love answering them <laughs>